And now I'd like to introduce uh, Bob McGuire, who's going to narrate tonight's uh, baseball program. Bob? But I don't say no. anything for you. Oh, you don't? Who's, who's, who's up? Brian Stutz. Brian film. Stutz. Oh, we have a film first. Thank you. All right. I'll have to rehearse better next time. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. That looks all right. Okay, all right. I know, and pretend we just pretend. All right, I'll take it easy with that. We just pretend that uh, we're organizing a baseball team here at the retired actors' home, and I am the manager. Now, you're going to be the manager of the retired actors' baseball team? Yes. I would like to join the retired actors' baseball team. Oh, you would. And I would like to know some of the guys' names on the team, so if I want to play with them, I know them, and I meet them on the street or in the home here, I can say hello to them. Oh, sure, but you know they give baseball players nowadays very peculiar names. No, a lot of funny names. You know, like uh, Sticky Sticky Fields. Sticky Fields. uh, Goofy Dan. Booby Bobber. Booby Bobber. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's see. Now, we have on our team, we have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out, the guy's name. uh That's what I want to find out, the guy's name. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Now, Abby, you want to be the manager of the baseball team? Yes. You know the guy's name? Oh, I should. Well, you tell me the guy's name on the baseball team. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. You ain't saying nothing to me yet. Go ahead and tell me. <laughs> I'm telling him. You ain't saying nothing yet. Go ahead and tell me. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. You know the guy's I'll... name's on the baseball team? Yes. Well, go ahead. Who's on first? Yes. I mean the guy's name. Who? The guy playing first. Who? The guy playing first base. Who? The guy on first base. <laughs> Who is on first? Why are you asking me for? I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. I'm asking you who's on first. That's his name. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. That's it. <laughs> That's his name. Well, you ain't said that. I ain't asked you nothing. You did. You know the guy's name on first base? Sure. Tell me the guy's name on first base. Who? <laughs> the guy playing first base. Who is on first, Lou? What are you asking me for? Uh, don't get excited. I'm saying... I'm asking you a simple question. Who's on first? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. That's it. That's who? <laughs> I'm asking you, what's the guy's name on first oh, base? Oh, no. What's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? One base at a time. <laughs> Don't mix up my... I'm not mixing up anybody. Now, what's the guy's name on first base? Now, what is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who is on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking. <laughs> Wait a minute, whoa. Now, well, let's not whoa, 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 whoa. How, how did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. I mentioned his name? Yes. I don't know anybody's name on the team. I, uh, how could I mention a guy's name? You did. You just mentioned it. All right. What's the guy's name on third base? No, what's on second? Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. He's on first. <laughs> I didn't even mention a guy's name on third base. Yes, you did. All right, then. Who's playing third base? No, who's on first? I'm not asking you what's on first. What's on second? Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. He's third base. <laughs> And I don't know anybody on a baseball team. You do. You mention their names. I do? Sure. You got an outfield? Well, naturally. The left fielder's name. Why? <laughs> I, I, I just thought I'd ask you. I just thought I'd ask you. Well, I just thought I'd tell you. Well, go ahead. Tell me. Tell you what? The left fielder's name. Why? Because I want to know. Because. Oh, he's center field. You know these players as well. Who's in center field? No, who's on first? What's on first? What's on second? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> Do you know the guy's name's on the team? Look, Louis, uh, you don't seem to understand. See, I have a first baseman. You, I know you got a first baseman. I asked you, what's, what's the first I asked you, what's the first baseman's name? No, what's the second baseman's name? I, I'm going to stop asking you, sir. I asked you, what's the first baseman's name? What's the second baseman? I don't even get past the first. All right, who's on second? Who's on first? What base do you want to talk about? You talk about anyone you want to talk about. All right, now who's on first? Right. Okay. I'm going to eat. All right, you got a first baseman. Yes. When you pay off the first baseman every month, who gets the money? Every dollar. <laughs> every dollar. Who gets it? He does. <laughs> Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's wife? Yes. <laughs> Why not, Lou? He's earned it. Who did? Yes. <laughs> Look, when you pay off the first baseman every month, you get a receipt from the guy? Sure. How does he sign his name? Who? Oh. The guy you give the money to. Who? Oh. The guy you give the money to. <laughs> Well, that's how he signs it. That's how who signs it? Yes. Who's going to come? That's it. Who? <laughs> Look, you go to first base. Yes. And you say to him, here's your money, sign the receipt. How does he sign his name? Who? The guy you give the money to. That's how he signs it. That's how who signs it? Yes. Sure. <laughs> you got to get a receipt from the guy, don't you? Get one room. How does the guy in first base sign his name? Who? The guy in first. That's how he signs it. I'm asking you, when you give the guy the money, what's the guy's name that you give the money to? Now, wait a minute. What signs his own? Who signs his own? No, who signs his? <laughs> I mean, what's the guy's name on first? 
first you can what go. What is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> I don't know, you got a pitcher on the team? Well, this will be a fine team without a pitcher. It's a fine team. What's the pitcher's name? Tomorrow. Uh, you know, I, can't, I, I can't change that name. You don't want to tell me the date? I'm telling you. Go ahead, tell me the pitcher's name. Tomorrow. <laughs> All right, what time tomorrow you tell me the pitcher's name? What time what? What time tomorrow you gonna tell me who's pitching? Who is not pitching? I'll break you line, you say who's not pitching. I wanna know what's the pitcher's name. What's on second? I don't know, third base, third base. Third base. You gotta catch it? Certainly you've got a catcher on a baseball team. Catcher's name? Today. Today. Tomorrow's pitching, today's catcher. Now you've got it. Now I got it. All I got, we got a couple of days on the team, that's all. I can't help that, Lou, I don't You know, I'm a pretty good catcher myself. And so they tell me. Yeah, now I get behind the plate and I'm gonna do some fancy catching and tomorrow's pitching on my team, right? Yeah. Now tomorrow he winds up the ball and I'm behind the plate and the heavy hitter gets up. Yeah. Now the heavy hitter gets up and, he, and he's ready to hit the ball and tomorrow's gonna throw the ball and I'm the catcher. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna try, tomorrow throws the ball and the guy up punched the ball. Now when he punched the ball, me being a good catcher, I want to throw the guy out of first base, so I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now that's the first thing you've said right. I don't even know what I'm talking about! <laughs> well, that's all you have to do! Is to throw the ball at first base! Yeah. Now who's got it? Naturally. Sure! <laughs> the guy is running at first base, yeah. and I want to throw the guy out! So? So I throw the ball to who? Naturally! I throw it to who? Naturally. <laughs> who's got it? Naturally. Huh. So I pick up the ball and I throw it to Naturally. No, no, no. no. <laughs> You throw the ball to first base, then who gets it? Naturally. That's it. Now you're missing <laughs> I pick up the ball, so I throw it to Naturally. You don't. I throw it to who? That's, That's what I'm saying! <laughs> I said I throw the ball to who? Naturally. You ask me. You throw the ball to who? Naturally. That's Same as you! Say it I throw the ball to Naturally. You don't. You throw it to who? Now who's got it? Naturally. That's what I said. <laughs> Whoever it is better get it. That's all I Don't worry about who. Who get it? Yes. He better get it. All right. Now, Throw the ball to whoever just drops the ball, so the guy runs a second. Who picks up the ball first? The what? What first? I don't know. I don't know. Throws it back to tomorrow. Triple play. Could be. Another guy gets up, and it's a long fly ball to be caused. Why? I don't know. He's on third, and I don't give a darn. I said, I don't give a darn. Oh, that's our shortstop. I mean, <laughs> Whoever wants to know the heart and mind of America had better learn baseball, the rules and realities of the game, and do it by watching first some high school or small town teams. This quote from God's Country and Mine speaks to the important place that baseball has in American life. It is our national pastime and played by boys of all ages. It is said to teach discipline, sportsmanship, and leadership. And as we will see, Wuben's boys of summer of baseball would become Wuben's future heroes and leaders of the community. Each games were played at schools. Shown here are two Cedar Street school pictures. Note the boys holding their baseball bats. In the 1850s and 60s, Wuben was a growing community. Shown here is Wuben Center in 1853. The picture of the center details the Elbridge Trolls Apothecary at the corner of Main and Union Street. This shot of Main and Montville Avenue, then Railroad Street, shows how little the framework of the downtown has changed. The Wuben National Bank is highlighted in this scene. Wuben's history encompasses more than pictures of buildings. It is also about how people spend their leisure time. Baseball flourished in this era. Baseball strictly activity was excuse me, prevalent in all parts of the city, mostly in the sand lots but organized teams did develop. In 1860, Wuben's Winnehasset Baseball Club boasted a roster of 14 players, and they played according to the rules of the New England Association of Baseball Players. In this newspaper account, a formal written challenge to a game was extended to the Zove Club of Stoneham, and it was quickly accepted by that squad. While few records exist, 
The Wuben High School team is mentioned in 1867 when they defeated the Warren Academy team 8 to 5. Throughout the country, baseball thrived. Playing baseball requires a certain discipline, and that aided these boys when the Civil War beckoned. Despite the hardships of war, baseball still had its place. These pictures of the infamous Salisbury Prison in North Carolina shows Union soldiers playing baseball. Wuben young men, John Brannigan, Miles Rowland, and Charles Scott died at that prison. Following the war, Wuben soldiers returned to the farms or tanneries, but the interest in baseball still burned within them. Teams became more formalized. Interest in baseball permeated all aspects of Wuben life. This story appeared in the Wuben Advertiser in 1871. It seems that a certain young man at one of Wuben's schools always had cold feet in winter. Well, this was a particularly cold day, and he had his legs perched on the edge of the stove, tilted back in his chair. As the reading lesson began, another student's baseball came rolling forward, stopping at the feet of the teacher. Without missing a beat, he reached down, picked up the ball, opened the stove door, and threw it in. Within minutes, a huge explosion was felt, shooting the flames and burning wood into the classroom. The ball also shot out, struck the backboard, and fell into the chalk tray. The young student with cold feet was sent sprawling. Without emotion, the teacher threw the burning embers out the window, lifted the student back into his chair, restored the stove to its perch, and resumed the reading lesson without further comment. It appears that a child with a baseball at school was commonplace, and not mention of any act of mixed conduct. In the 1870s, teams became more organized. Here is a picture of the North Wuben Websters. Newspapers reported on many games. The Wuben Go-Aheads, the Essex Nine of Wuben Center, the Somerset Club of Central Square played at the Wyman Field. The young Swiftfoots played their Wicked Nine of Bredford Street at Nichols Rock. The Athletics of Woods Hill played the Wyomings of Academy Hill. The Monitors and Shamrocks played at Lewis Field on New Boston Street. Other teams of the day included the Rocket Baseball Club, the Water Street Nine, the Emeralds, the Royals, and the Dexters. Other fields of that period included Fishers Field in North Hooban, Salem Street Park, Winds Field, Vernon Street Field, and Dow's Field where the St. Charles team played. If you live in any of these areas now, dig a whole big hole in your backyard and you may find a baseball from 1870. Professional baseball teams were organized, and in these years, they experienced growing pains before the current National and American League solidified. In 1877, Albert Goodwill Spaulding, a renowned retired player, former manager and current owner, exhibited some leadership and drafted a set of baseball rules and guide. Included in those rules was a requirement that only a specific glove could be used by the league. Of course, those gloves were only sold by his new company, Spalding Sporting Goods. He also introduced a new uniform system, shown here. Note that each uniform was a different color, responding to the position played. Do you think the Spalding Sporting Goods Company sold those uniforms too? The experiment was short-lived as players rebelled. One player quipped, it's an insult to all of us to make a professional player dressed like a clown. Wuben was growing, and so was the baseball interest. We see a parade ambling its way down Main Street. Lyceum Hall is shown decorated with bunting. Do you think our current players would use the equipment from this period to play in the field? Before we leave the 1800s, we must tell you about a base player, baseball player, Ferdy Harkins. While a baseball player of the 1890s, Ferdy became a professional polo player, playing many of his games in Wuben. No, not that polo with horses. The polo played on roller skates. Long before I, local ice skating rinks developed, indoor roller skating was in fashion. The Wuben Auditorium was the scene of casual skating and professional roller polo. Similar to the rules of ice hockey, it was a fast and hard-hitting game 
played on wooden floors in a smaller space, about 80 by 40 feet. Using a hard rubber ball, the goalie wore padding and mask, but did not wear skates. Wuben was a bustling city in 1900. Automobiles and horses shared the street. The busy bed was taking the shape that would last 100 years. A significant event in baseball coverage in Wuben occurred in 1901. The Wuben Daily Times opened for business and devoted much ink to the local baseball scene. Early sports coverage was uniquely provided by James Hegarty Sr. Obviously a sports enthusiast, he understood the importance of highlighting local teams and players. He noted baseball stats that have now become commonplace in our sports page reading requirements. Shown here is the first Wuben Daily Times sports page in 1902. Note that baseball receives front page coverage. Baseball interests began at an early age. The 1906 team sits for a formal picture. The Wuben High School team generated much interest in the city. Shown here is the 1905 team that won the Middlesex League with an 11-2 record. The champion St. Charles team is shown here. Sitting for this photo was the 1913 team that featured three members of the Weaver clan, including George Kaika Weaver, for whom Weaver Park is named. We also see Connie O'Doherty and Steve Colucci, who were very famous during that era. Baseball has always had its controversies, so that no one should be surprised that Wuben has its own to tell. Pictured here is the 1914 championship team of both the Middlesex and Mystic Valley leagues, at least for a time. It seems that the last game of the season pitted Stoneham against Wuben, the winner becoming the champion. Wuben won the game 2-1 in an exciting match. In the first inning of the game, the Stoneham pitcher questioned the distance from the pitcher's mound to home plate. The umpire decided that he was correct and ordered the grounds crew to correct it. Seemingly all was satisfied since no other complaints surfaced during the game. The next day, representatives from Stoneham made their way to Library Field and measured the distance again, even though the pitcher's mound had been removed. An official inquiry by the league was demanded and Stoneham prevailed. Wuben's principal and the Wuben Daily Times castigated Stoneham. Not only did Wuben have to forfeit the game, but the Middlesex and Mystic Valley leagues ejected them from playing. Wuben was eventually accepted by the Mystic Valley League, but Wuben did not res resume Middlesex League play for over 50 years. The schedule show here highlights non-league schedule that they were forced to make as a result of the 1914 controversy. The 1912 Wuben Daily Times sports coverage is interesting since it illustrates the lack of photos. Cartoons, caricatures, or sketches were used instead. Also note that this cartoon speaks to the play of Billy Rupp, a good pl baseball player of the day. Like their relatives of 1860, the young men of 1917 went to war. This article in the Wuben Daily Times covered their entry into the Civil War beginning with an encampment at Library Field. Wuben soldiers are pictured there. This slide shows some of the returning soldiers arriving at the Highland Street Station in the South End. Obviously no longer there. Earlier in the decade, William Billy Rupp played for the North Wubens at Library Park. His son, Charles Wendell Rupp, left Library Field with the 101st never to return, for he was killed in action in Fleury, France in 1918, alongside Charles Lynch from Wuben. He would not be Wuben's only loss. 34 would not come home. Charles Wendell Rupp was honored for his sacrifice by the city of Wuben. Another who perished in World War I was Peter J. Fleming, a lifelong South Ender. He died in the war in France. He was honored by his city by naming the former Hudson Street Field in his name. He play, had played there as a young man. I think we all know where that is, where the clap school is. In elaborate ceremonies, Company G of the 101st was honored on October 21st, 1919 on Wuben Common. While the armistice was not signed until November 11th, 
Company G was discharged before the war ended. Baseball articles were appearing in the Rubin Daily Times, many calling for additional leagues to be formed due to the interest in playing the game. They said that the Leather City is a baseball city. Responding to the call in June of that year, a new industrial league was formed. Initially, five teams completed, including Merrimack Chemical Company, Beggs and Cobb, Van Tassel Tanning Company, James Roberts and Robertson and Sons, and Wuben Machine Company. As the years would pass, more players and more teams would follow. The J.J. Riley Company would soon join the ranks of industrial teams. You know that baseball has reached a milestone when the talk begins on who is the best player. Well, Jim Dobbins, Wuben's well-known sports cartoonist, took on that task by asking readers to pick the all-time Wuben players by position. He then announced the winners by creating this sport tune, as he called it. Winning the fans' votes were notables as Arthur Jock O'Conlon, Henry Doc McMahon, who later became a longtime Wuben High School baseball coach, Chuck O'Roach, Hal Weefer, and Tweet Walsh. Clearly, if you want to be remembered as a legendary player, you must have a clever nickname. This photo of the Wuben High School Mystic Valley Champs of 1921 is notable because it heralds the return to that league following the controversy of 1914. The 1923 Wuben High School team is shown here, including players Ed Coates, Frank Cuneo, Tom Martin, Charlie Mahoney, and Mark B Bart McDonough, who would later coach the Wuben High School team for many years. Crossy McElhinney is shown front right. Wuben High School in 1926 added players Max Carey, Deacon Fields, Ron Weefer, and Walter Carroll. The Wuben High School Mystic Valley Championship of 1927 is shown here. We note Patrick Packy Joyce in the back row. Before we venture into the 1930s, it is important to comment on the many teams not mentioned here. Teams such as the Eurekas, Union, the Lightfoots, the Stars, the Rosebuds, and the Actives were teams of the past, but little documentation was found. If you have any information on these teams, please contact the Movement Historical Society. The Great Depression. The catastrophic collapse of the stock market in 1929 ushered in the Great Depression. Unemployment soared and manufacturing output fell drastically, soon becoming a worldwide economic slump that lasted throughout the decade. Despite these hard times, neighborhood baseball teams were formed in all areas of Wuben. City and municipal leagues were established. Baseball became an important outlet for participant and fan alike. This team camaraderie forged friendships that lasted a lifetime. There are 90-year-olds amongst us who can recall details of their teams and their teammates. It was a harsh but memorable time. Sandlot ball was played everywhere in the city. While not strictly a baseball picture, this photo of Wuben firefighters of the time is a good representation of the hard-working young men who still found time to play baseball. It was a necessary outlet. In the same vein, this is a photo of the day showing the North Wuben Hose House approaching North Wuben Center from the south. This picture is an entry into our discussion of the North Wuben teams of the era. This is a ticket stug from a baseball game played at the North Wuben between the North Wuben Tigers and Our Lady of Solace Athletic Club of Bronx, New York. Now, do you think they were a bunch of nice guys, nice friendly guys from Bronx? The cost was 10 cents, and the visiting team would be given a donation. It should be noted that throughout this whole period, it was common to pass the hat as a means to pay the umpires. It should also be noted that the North Wuben Tigers played at the North Wuben Playground, or Tiger Field as it was known then. This was not the Ferrillo Field that we now know, but this field was farther on May, up on Main Street, past Wheeling Street in the hollow. And I have advised that it was not like the well-manicured -manic field of today. This picture of the 1934 North Wuben Tigers speaks volumes about those young men who played the game and went on to become community leaders. 
Names like Ferrillo, Corsetti, Cardelline, Crescenzi, and Ballesteri remain in our current lexicon. Note the car on the right. Ralph Ferrillo standing with the straw hat in the back, piled each team member in the car and drove them away to away games. The North Wuben Tigers had a female fan base too. This picture submitted by a friend of both Ralph Rillo Jr. and Carmela D'Alessio Shelsey, pictured here at the North Wuben Bandstand, commented on the great friendships that developed among the boys and girls that followed the team. This newspaper clipping details the baseball match between the North Wuben Reds and the North Wuben Badgers for the North Wuben Neighborhood Championship. The pitching and batting star of the game was Bob Vary, who would later author a sports column for the Wuben Daily Times. You will recognize many of the names from this photo of the 1942 North Wuben Reds. Pictured as Frank Procopio, Fran Lavecchia, Ollie Galanti, Tom McDonough, and John Coco. Many of you may remember John Coco as a furniture salesman in Ronald, at Royal Furniture. Anybody remember him there? Oh, yeah, okay, good. This cartoon of the North Wuben Reds by Jim, Robin, Jim Dobbins excuse me, introduces the newest members of the team, Ben Barati and Connie O'Doherty. The third member of the North Wuben triangle of teams was the North Wuben Hobos. Here, William Pappy White, a member of that team, is shown dressed for success in his jaunty outfit. The North Wuben Ho Hobos drew most of their squad from North Wuben, especially at the Kearsarge Avenue section. 103-year-old William White is active and still living in his family home in North Woburn. This newspaper clipping details the box score of the game between the North Woburn Reds and Candyland. The Candyland team featured players named Charlie Annis, Ed App, and Arthur Venus. Venus, excuse me. The Candyland team was sponsored by Charles Annis, Annis owner of a well-known Woburn restaurant. In the South End, the Wuben Elk sponsored Sinclairs dominated the scene, managed at times by Cute Higgins, Walter Carroll, and Bill Shaughnessy, with players George Porter, Mike Murray, Ben and George Barati, Billy Burke, Bing Crosby, and Joe McKee. It continued as a strong team throughout the period. This Dobbin cartoon depicts additional players for the Sinclairs, including Zigzy Beatty, Bob Bradley, Bob Higgins, Bill Goof McGovern, and Joe Devaney. The West Side boasts of the Noshitogs. Here in another caricature, the management team is highlighted. Coach Apps Parsons, President George Cockburn, Secretary Ziggy Sigmund, and ticket chairman John O'Doherty. This photo captures a Noshitog team pictured at their home field at the West Side Playground. Included in this photo are Ozzie McClay, Ralph Ferrillo, Tut Cassidy, John Shaga Shaughnessy, Spot Nagel, Cal Marion and John Martini. In these three sketches celebrating the 1936 Wuben High School teams, Jim Dobbins sees only a bright future for the team, including names like Walter Doherty, Luke Griffin, Carl Torres, Bob Twombly, Bill Sweeney, Johnny Fitzpatrick, Hammy Hamilton, Tim DeRosa, and Ino Koski. We leave the baseball scene in the 1930s with this serene photo of four bicyclists at Horn Pond testing their Schwins. In the foreground are Eddie DeVito and George Barati. This quiet and peaceful scene will soon be replaced by the horrors of war. We begin the early years of the 40s where we left off at Horn Pond, but George Barati and his friends have traded their bicycles for an automobile. In December of 1941, however, these and other boys of summer will leave the serenity of Wuben and disperse throughout the world fighting for our freedom. The greatest generation will make its mark not only in the war, but in the community when they return. Over 3,600 Wuben men and women will serve, but sadly, 81 never came back. Prior to the war, Wuben High School featured some of its best players in its history. This sketch celebrates her of Bobby Roach, was also noted for his football play as well as his leadership as the class president. 
In this outline of the 1941 team, names such as Martin, Callahan, Burke, Stokes, Halliday, and Nagel emerge. Coach Bart McDonough gets prominent billing in this caption for the 1942 team. New names like Abreu, Tedesco, White, and Devaney are noted. Bart McDonough coached Woburn High School baseball from 1935 to 1964, except for three years when he served in World War II. This picture provides an illustration of the impact of World War II on the community. While many were already serving abroad, others remained to play the game, but only until they were old enough to serve. While it wasn't possible to determine how many of them from the 1943 Woburn High School team left the baseball field for the battlefield during the year, you still recognize many of the names to understand the impact. The roster included Bob Martin, Bob Sharon, Frankie Stokes, Charlie McElhenney, Zigzy Beatty, Walter Scally, Dick Roach, Walter Lang, Bernie Walsh, Coach Ray Whalen, Bobby Perry, John Boots Devaney, Jackie Doherty, Al Curran, Butter Abreu, Benny Barati, and Athletic Director Bucky Walsh. In 1941, this article appeared in the Woburn Daily Times. It listed the rosters of the 10-team Municipal League that played at Library Field at 6 o'clock. The league would dissolve after the season due to World War II, but would be resurrected in 1947. The teams were the Tanners, the Wright Club, the Montville Club, Mass Gear, Demos All-Stars, Central Square Cubs, Candyland, Parker Orioles, Amicos, and the Noshatog Club. Pictured here is the 1942 Parker Orioles. Familiar names abound. Not previously mentioned elsewhere are Frank McGann, who would later be called Father McGann, Jimmy Maharis, Mike Picopoulos, and Jerry Cristaldi. This foursome of Frank McGann, Henry Lancelotta, George Barardi, and Eddie DeVito are pictured at the Woburn High School field. It is uncertain if this is a team picture or friends playing against each other. But the different uniforms could explain the fact that often if you played for more than one team, you wore whatever uniform you might have. The picture of the 1946 North Woburn Reds finds some new names. Billy McManus, Joe Ross, Red Patterson, John O'Connor, and Jimmy Brogner. In the 1946 47 photo, we see an unnamed team. Note the, name, note the various uniforms. New faces include Tony Scaroni, Frank Castiglione, Ozzie Julie, Luke Castiglione, Frank Lazaki, Charlie DePanfilo, Gene Vasapoli, and Red Murphy. This action picture shows a sea club batter hitting in the game at Woburn High School field. It should be noted that we attempted to recognize as many players as we could. Often, many could not be identified from the photos. We also tried to avoid repeating names, but so many young men played for multiple teams throughout the period that we couldn't avoid it. Recognition should also be given to the Woburn Daily Times, and especially James Haggerty Sr., who wrote most of the sports articles during this period. I leave you with this headline that he wrote on the article covering the game between the Atlantic Gelatin and Cannon Nealon teams. Jellos out jellied by red and green paper hangers. The man loved his words, didn't he? <laughs> Finally, as we close out the 1940s, we pay tribute to those who left the playing fields to serve in World War II, not forgetting those who in a few short years would serve in the Korean conflict. In this Jim Dobbins piece, he pays tribute to three Wuban athletes, Charlie McSheffrey, Frank Cullen, and Frank Pandolf who left for the war but returned missing an arm or a leg. Titled the trio that gave, we will let this picture represent all that gave. As a result of their playing, paying the supreme sacrifice in World War II, three Wuban men were honored by their city by naming the playing fields where they enjoyed baseball as young men before they went off to war. Pictured here is Francis Cupi Gonzalez, who was killed in action in Italy in 1944. A baseball player in his youth, the West 
Side Field was named in his honor. Pictured is present day Gonzales Field. Warren F. Leland, pictured here, was a resident of East Woburn. He was shot down and killed during a flying mission in 1944 after he left Saipan. His brother Frederick was killed in Germany in 1945. This field in East Woburn was named Leland Park in honor of the brothers. Leland Park is now used for baseball and football games. Before I note our next honoree, I want to acknowledge the hard work on research and technical issues provided by Kathy Lucero, Michelle Ferrillo, Ellen Hamilton, Sue Ellen Holland, and Bill Callahan in this project. They did all of the real work. I'm just the pretty face and the talking head. <laughs> but I have another reason. During the discussion of the project, we reviewed this next picture. And the women that I mentioned earlier absolutely went nuts over this next guy. They apparently think that he's quite handsome. I personally don't get it. So I'll gauge if you agree with them by your reaction. Ellen? <laughs> Sir, he's not that good looking. This is John Jackie Ferrillo, who displayed baseball in the family tradition in North Woburn. He was missing in action in a flying mission over Sardinia, Italy in 1943 and presumed dead in 1944. Ferrillo Field in North Woburn was named in his honor and it continues to be the site of baseball games. Jackie Ferrillo was further honored by naming the Ferrillo trophy, trophy after him. It has been awarded each year to the player judged to have exhibited the best sportsmanship and gentlemanly con conduct along with a high standard of play. Originally awarded in 1946 to John Bucky Carnes, it continues to this day to be an award coveted by Woburn High School baseball players. This is Ferrillo Field today. In this picture, you see the dedication of the new scoreboard at Furlow Field. We see here the presentation of the 1994 Furlow Trophy presented to Corey Dillon by Louis Furlow, alongside the recipient of the Harry Matarosian Trophy, Michael O'Neill, presented by Agnes Matarosian. The American Legion began supporting baseball teams in 1926. It followed the pattern of local Legion teams playing against each other, leading to a national playoff event. Woburn had teams over the years, but it was discontinued for a period after 1939. It was considered an honor and a matter of prestige to be selected for a team and wear the Legion patch on your uniform. Resurrected, we now see the 1947 American League's Junior League team, American Legion Junior League team, excuse me, of 16 and 17 year olds. Included in this picture were John Martini, Shanka Martin, Bob Garvey, Bill Weefer, Ralph Coakley, Fred Hill, and Fred Brown, who would later be wounded twice in Korea. This is the 1948 team, including Art Vino, Butch McLaughlin, Charlie Curran, and Ed Corey. The Legion team of 1958 included Dick Haggerty, Bob Spencer, Richie Walsh, Billy Donaghy, and Jim Parsons. When World War II ended, the boys of baseball returned as mature young men, eager to go to work, start a family, and pursue the American dream. While passion for the game of baseball never waned, involvement in the game took on a different look. Softball caught the imagination of some, while others took to coaching. But they were all concerned about the next generation of boys and put their concern into action. The Woburn Boosters Club was devoted to the welfare of Woburn's children. They had a real concern about the rising trend of juvenile delinquency in the country. It organized sports programs in multiple sports, including baseball. They had sports nights. In 1947, we see in this picture, President Bill Shaughnessy with attributions to Tom Higgins, Charles Ryan, John Gonzalez, Bill Dunnigan, and others. This group was committed to providing an outlet for the youth of Woburn. This editorial cartoon exhorts the people of Woburn to support the cause and join the many groups and individuals already involved. Already on board were church groups, baseball clubs, the police department, Woburn High School, service clubs, and many individuals. 
If you were a parent of a 10-year-old boy or girl, and this man said to you, I have a great idea for your child. Send him or her down to City Hall. We'll provide some food, drink, and a baseball ticket for nothing. Put them on a bus, send them to Boston for a Major League Baseball game, find them after the game, put them back on the bus, and drive them back to City Hall. What would you say to him? Well, in 1964, he hired 40 buses and took 2,000 Wuben children to Fenway Park. He was Mr. Wuben Day, Charlie Riley. He began the program in 1925 and continued it on his own with donations from local businesses for 40 years. Only because the Red Sox required in 1946 that a tax be paid for the baseball ticket did he need to charge each youngster 20 cents. Prior providing a recreation outlet for, uh, for Wuben children was his life's work. He served in the city council and put forward legislation to form an official recreation committee, the forerunner of the recreation commission. Look at this fine group of youngsters gathered at Moran Park as getting ready for the game. What could possibly happen? These young boys are boarding the bus for the trip to Boston in 1953. These are the buses lined up before the boarding began. You can see the line making its way in front of City Hall, taking a right down the alley between City Hall and the bank. This is where you got your box lunch, drink and a cap before boarding the bus for Boston. Well, they are ready to go, and look at the mess on the street. Trust me, it only gets worse as they drive through Winchester. With momentum provided by the Booster Club and the longtime efforts of Charlie Riley, pictured here in his later years, the Recreation Commission was formed and set out to provide the various recreational outlets envisioned by those who came before them. Playground baseball leagues had already been established by Charlie Riley in the 20s and 30s. Charlie organized teams, arranged schedules, and settled disputes. He even arranged to have championship games played at Braves Field or Fenway Park. The Recreation Commission and now the Recreation Department had a mission to increase the number of sporting activities and expand the playground program. Jim Dobbins congratulated the Recreation Commission in this cartoon for a success successful 1948 season. He made special note that it was the third year in a row without a drowning at Foley Beach. Pictured were Jim Tedesco, director, commission members, employees in the field. This is a typical playground of the 1950s, where there was open space, clear it, and play baseball. This is a picture of the Green Street Playground area. And actually, it encompasses more than the area, but for want of a better term, let's call it the Green Street Playground area. For perspective, the photo was taken from Green Street looking north. You can see the smokestack of the Garassi Tannery on Eastern Avenue, where the original Shamrock School was built. In the middle of the picture, in the background, is the Liberty Avenue Veterans Housing. This picture was taken in the early 50s. I want to note one thing. You can see Kathy Lucero's childhood home from this vantage. And if you have good eyesight, you can see her bossing around her brothers and sisters. <laughs> I grew up on the other side of this housing and want to acknowledge the great families that lived there and whose friendships still I still have like the O'Donnells, Lallies, Loaders, Cherries, DeRoses, Costas, Steigels, and of course the Kellys. At the front of this site is the Cox Wading Pool. Charlie Riley, who I mentioned earlier, was a driving force in the construction of this facility. His mark is on many recreational projects in the city. The Recreation Commission and Recreation Department has always had strong leadership. Shown here from a few years ago is a, re a photo of the retired Recreation Director Tom Jones, longtime Commissioner Louis Ferrillo, and current Director Rory Lindstrom. Gone are the stores pictured in the 1950 photo of downtown Woburn, but it set the backdrop for returning veterans. With fields at a premium and softball gaining momentum as a sport, it wasn't long before teams began to organize. 
In this sport tune, Jim Dobbins highlights the softball pitching wizards of the day, including Jim Cute Higgins, Ivor Paulson, George Emery, Fran Piper, and Bill Stigles, longtime veterans agent mover. The first of the softball teams was started by Joe O'Brien and his employees at Joe O'Brien and Sons Paint and Wallpaper Store in the south end of Oban. Shown here in this picture with his five sons, Joe O'Brien was a supporter of their recreation activities in Oban. His son Ned was a casualty of the Vietnam War. The O'Brien Skating Rink is named in his honor. Softball leagues became organized quickly and they were a popular sporting event to watch. Shown here is the 1949 championship moose team that dominated the league, winning the championship from 1948 to 51. Familiar names on the team were Bob, Shanka, and Hugger Martin, Billy Burke, Jay Courtney, Charlie and Oki O'Connor, and Jack Riley, to name a few. The Bennett's SO team is all smiles. Well-known participants include Paul Lennon, Angie Piazza, Johnny Fields, Jake McLaughlin, and Spex McGee. A powerhouse team of the period was the Lukey Sunoco team. They are shown here celebrating their winning the City Softball Championship and the Metropolitan Boston Amateur Softball Championship. Notable members of the team include Paul Delaney, Joe Caruso, Billy Donaghy, Eddie Tanjo Foley, and Eddie Callahan. Softball even reached into the ranks of political life. This photo shows city officials gathered to play ball. Even the police got involved in the 1950s support recreation. By, the, by forming the Women's Police Athletic League was formed to create athletic events in multiple sports. The Pony League was their baseball component and it was started by police officers Leo McElhinney and Kenny Murphy. This announcement in the Women Daily Times listed all players, teams, and managers. The six teams were managed by Leo McElhinney, Bill Cogan, Guy Lucia, Bill White, Bill Donahue, and Dick Packard. Jimmy Pearsall, outfielder for the Red Sox, is shown here presenting Bobby Murphy with his championship jacket. Of particular note, the others in the picture, Chief Thomas McGuire, Officers Ken and Leo McElhinney, would at one time or another assume the office of Chief. This Pony League Championship team is congratulated by Mayor Murray. Team members included Jim Hagerty, Jimmy Kilbride, Jim Glennon, Joe Caruso, Charlie Porter, Joe McGivery, and Jimmy Foley. Another Pony League team pictured at Gonzales Park include Eddie Willeff, Dick Tracy, Bill Spoladoro, Paul Golden, and Bob Murphy. Leo McElhinney must have been babysitting that day. His oldest son, Dennis, is shown in the foreground. Leo McElhinney is shown registering applicants for the Pony League at the, at the Wuben Police Station. I think that's why they were there. <laughs> Wuben High School baseball teams competed in the Northeastern Conference in the 1950s and produced some of the best baseball players who went on to remain to become leaders of the community. The 1951 Northeastern Championship team is shown here. Some familiar names include Tom Duran, Fred Deco, Red Real, Ray Pino, Joe Barati, Bernie Wells, Butch McLaughlin, and Angie Piazza. This was Wuben's first championship team in 23 years. But yet, another war disrupted peacetime activities. Baseball had to wait for many of these men as they went off to the Korean conflict. Angie Piazza was one of those baseball players. He is cited in this newspaper article for his heroic exploits as a Marine in Korea. He will return to play again, become a police officer in Wuben, and become active in the Wuben community. Paul Monk Foley stands out as one of the leading pitchers, pitchers of this era. A lefty who set the Wuben High School record for wins with 22, which still stands today. He is highlighted in this article along with another standout, Joe Castiglione. Paul contributed to his own win with three hits. Joe Casti Castiglione is always mentioned when talking about Wuben's best baseball players. In Casti's case, his name is also mentioned when it comes to football. 
In this article detailing his junior league team's win, he went four for four. Six women high school players are featured in this montage. Familiar names of Joe Castiglione, Dickie White, Paul Lennon, who later become Dr. Paul Glennon, Nick Cousy, Paul Marshall, and Paul McElhenney, who many will remember as a principal of the Wuben school system, continued as adults to bring prestige to the community. In this 1955 Wuben High School team practice session, these players posed for the camera. There were Paul Marshall, Paul Lennon, Bob Murphy, Paul Murphy, Pat Tatucci, and Dickie White. In addition to the players detailed in the previous photo, other members from the 1955 team included the, only the first name initials here, but I'm taking a guess at the names. I think I know who they are. Tim Walsh, Ron White, and Jimmy Kilbride. Of all the baseball programs that were initiated in the 50s, Little League Baseball has endured the longest. Formed in 1951 by concerned citizens, this grassroots group epitomized the volunteer spirit of Wuben that would evolve along many different areas in the years to come. While criticized by some as too organized and too controlled, Little League Baseball res was responding to the times. In this picture, you see Bob Vary Jr. being held by his sister, Terry Vary McCormick, admiring a Little League baseball player in 1952. This is the organizing committee making plans for the inaugural season in 1952, seated as Tom Higgins, first president of Wuben Little League. He would go on to become chairman of the school committee and serve three terms as mayor. Bob Vary was the driving force in creating a Little League program in Wuben. Through his ramblings column in the Wuben Daily Times, he wrote often on the benefits of a formal baseball league for youngsters, formed, run, and coached by parents. He is shown here with his daughter, Terry. The inaugural season, each season thereafter, began with a parade. This early parade features Ollie Galanti, Bob Vary, Bill Redfern, Red Patterson, and Clint Smith in the lead. Umpires behind in their uniforms are led by Louis Ferrillo. Proud Little League teams stroll past the first national store. Pictured here is George Keiko Weifer, a woman baseball player of renown from the first half of the century. He played for local Sandlot and semi-pro teams. The uncle of Paul Foley mentioned earlier, his career is recognized with the naming of the Little League field at Forest Park and his name. Weifer Park is shown here in its original state with a wooden fence. Once arriving at Weeper Park, parade members circle the field to listen to the welcoming speeches. The umpire's uniforms were donated by Farino Studios, as you can plainly see in the stenciling on their back. The 1953 mask, gear, and tool team posed in front of the backstop at Weeper Park. Coach Pat Shaughnessy's team included Pete Carbone, Dick Packard, Bob Irwin, and Joe Andriolo. The Elks team of 1952 is poised for a big season, led by coaches Bob Martin and Bill Burke. The team included Al Tancredi, Frank Borselli, Eddie McDonald, Dick Martin, and Bobby Spicer. Well, this Yankee certainly didn't like that call. I wonder if the other team was the Red Sox. I couldn't tell. Wuben is well represented at this official signing by Governor Sargent. Note George Barati on the left, and our own Joe Crowley on the right. By the way, Joe still has that sport coat. <laughs> he left. <laughs> the Little League season cannot begin until the official first pitch is thrown. This Kiwanis team was the 1952 champs, led by manager Joe Altavester and coaches John Padalina and Frank DiOrio. The team included Mike Bonullo, Dick Hagerty, Jimmy McInerney, George Callanan, Dave Bartlett, and Jimmy McManus. In 1953, Joe Colucci brought his squad from last to first place and won the championship. With his coaches Joe Booza and Ronnie Outridge, players included Wiley Fitchett, 
Tom O'Brien, Jim Kodak, Jackie Powers, Mel Skanks, and Bobby Smith. The season was successful. The 1954 Little League Sports Night Award winners display their mementos. They were Jim Murray, Dickie Halliday, Carl Seagren, Billy Donaghy, Jake Townsend, Richie Walsh, Rocky Burnham, and Larry Brown. Looks out to me. Women Little League throughout its history has endeavored to meet the baseball needs of all children. In the mid-70s, they ventured into girls softball and expanded as teams were needed. In a more recent effort, the program responded to those children with special needs and initiated the Challenger program. Shown here are two ball players from that program. Louis Ferrillo, Mike Martini, and George Barati represent many years of service to Little League Baseball and the City of Woburn. When talking about baseball in Woburn, you cannot separate the game from the impact that the game had on its young men. Some of these young men went from the playing fields to the battlefields. Some never returned. But all who played the game learned many life lessons. While we mention a number of names tonight, it merely scratches the surface of those who played the game and went on to become leaders of the community. Baseball was an important nexus from childhood to adulthood. We close tonight's presentation with an interview of George Barati. He represents all of those who came before us and contributed to the fabric of the community. His baseball contribution encompasses his 60-year involvement in Little League Baseball, beginning with his umpiring in Woburn Little League's initial season in 1952 to his current position as Massachusetts State Director. Mr. George Barati. born in Woburn on 47 Highland Street, the Homestead, and uh, my mother's maiden name was Vazapoli, and they, uh, they came from Italy, and when they came from Italy, I had a younger brother, Tony, that was a year old, and uh, so when they came here, my aunt, actually my great aunt, my mother's aunt, they had no children, but they'd already been here, so they, we moved in with them. And we stayed together ever since. Really? Now, who are your other brothers other than Tony? Uh, Benny and Joe. Benny and Joe. Yeah. Benny, uh, they both played for the high school baseball. In fact, when Benny played, Benny was a good ball player. He, was ready, he got a tryout with the Red Sox. Did he really? Yes. And they were ready to sign him. And the umpire at that time, one of the weepers from Woburn, Major League umpire, he said, Benny, he says, don't sign now, wait till you come out of the service, which was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. See, because if he had signed before he went in, when he came out, they were obligated to, to, to keep him. keep him. You know? Right. What year was that? That was in 44. 1944. Yeah. Wow. And George, how about your other brother? Joe? Uh-huh. Yeah. He, he was a pitcher at Woburn High School. He was. How old are you now, George? I'm 87. 87. So you remember, obviously, the late 30s and into the pre-war years and yeah. that type of thing. and then we played in the 40s. Uh -huh. We had, it's amazing, we don't even have one baseball team in Woburn today. We had eight baseball teams. We had the North Woburn Reds, the West Side National Togs, Mass Gear and Tool, East Woburn Giants, uh, South End Parker Orioles, which I played with, you know, and we had a league right in Woburn, like an amateur league. Really? And all Woburn ball players. We had some great ball players. Really? Can and you... now today they can't even get one team together. Now that's for all. That was for adults after after high school type of thing. Yeah. Correct. Did you always had a high school team? Yeah. 
And why do you think baseball was so strong in those days? Well, I think they followed, they had a tannery up in uh, Knott's Woburn. Well, we had all, all the tanneries and uh, Lord Tanners, and they, they had a baseball team, and, and their uniforms were red. I never forgot it. They played at Library Park. Did they? Yeah, and they were the first amateur baseball team. And the, did they play against other tanneries, or how did that work? No, they played outside teams. Outside teams. Yeah. We would play any place. In fact, if we went on a field, if we had to go to eat, only half of us would go to eat so we wouldn't lose the position of the field. Because once you get off the field, another team would take it over. Oh, really? The, to practice, yeah. Oh, really? But baseball was big. I, in fact, I managed the Park Orioles the year we won the city championship. Now, in, in high school, did you play ball? No. You didn't play ball? No. How did you get involved in Little League and how did you get involved in umpiring? What happened, Bob Vary was the one really that started Little League. He was a sports writer for the Times. Mm -hmm. And in those days, they used to get UP and APS news, and he finally got to get together with four or five guys. He said, you know, they got this new program there, National Little League Baseball. He said, we ought to look into it. So they met him and Bill Coyne had a laundromat up the center, Bill Crosby, Ollie Galani, Bob Berry, and a few of the others. And they said, you know, we'll start this program. And, uh, and, and that's what they did. In fact, Tommy Higgins was our first president. He was? Yeah. Wow. And uh, so I got a call from Bob one day, and I was close to him. He says, you know what? We're looking for umpires. I said, Bob, I don't want an umpire. I says, what the hell made you think of that? He says, let me tell you something. Every time you played, you always gave the umpires a bad time. <laughs> now you're going to be on the other side and see how it feels. And that's how I started umpiring. And what year did you start? We started in 52. Uh, 1952. Yeah. And that's when Little League officially started in Woburn? Yeah. Okay. And We actually started in 51 in the winter. Mm -hmm when they all got together. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there was myself, Henry Lancelot, Eddie Yap, and uh, Ollie and them, and we were doing the umpiring, you know. And uh, between the three organizations, the Lions, the Rotary, and the uh, Kiwanis, mm -hmm. they helped build We For Park. Oh, did they? Yeah, the city gave us some help, but they helped build We For Park, put up the, the old wooden fence, was and, that at 1952 also? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then we had uh, Bernie McLaughlin from North Woburn. He was a greenskeeper at the country club. So he knew his grass and lawns and stuff. So he supervised the whole layout of the, the grass and the stuff, you know. And how was the idea of starting Little League and Woburn perceived by everybody? Was it, a, was it a, like if they ever thought it was a great idea? Or? Oh, yeah. We started with four major league teams and four minor league teams. And then we had a clinic. And then the next year it grew bigger and bigger, you know. And uh, today we got uh, 14 major league teams, you know, 14 minor league teams. We got triple A, double A, single A, a clinic, T-ball. Wow, and we have uh, softball too, but that's and different. And we have softball. Yeah. yeah. Who were some of the coaches? Uh, Bill Redfern, uh, Joe Altavesta, uh, Johnny Murphy, the first ones that started, and uh, Weefa, which they named the field after, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, then the others start coming in. Yeah, where did the uniforms come from for the kids? Huh? Where did the uniforms come from? From the sponsors. Our, our first sponsors were all the Civic Association, the Lions, oh, the Rotary. Was. The Kiwanis, they were the first ones. So they also sponsored not only building Weefer Park. Right, they sponsored the teams. But getting the kids. Yeah. How about the first uh, Little League opening day? Do you remember that? Oh, it was unbelievable. Was it? It was unbelievable. Yeah? We had the parade just like we still do. And uh, Farino Studios, Pat, he sponsored the Empires. We had uniforms. You did? 
we had, you know, the umpire's uniforms in the back of said Farino Studios, and he paid for the uniforms. Did he? Yeah. That was quite a contribution. It was. It was. How many umpires did you have to start with, and who were they? Do you remember? Uh, myself, Eddie Yap, uh, Peter Duran, uh, Nicky Lemon, uh, Henry Lancelot. I think we started out with probably uh, 12. 12. And we'd do it, all the games. I was going to say, who did the scheduling? And Never got paid. The day I quit umpiring the Wuban was the day they started paying umpires. Oh, wow. When was that? I forget what year. And I said, look at the fellas. This was not for me. Um, I want to go back, George. When you first umpired the first day and you didn't want to be an umpire, are there any funny stories or do you remember any calls that were challenged or did it come back to bite you? <laughs> that what they like, they, the gentleman it, it said. It wasn't that walked. bad. Yeah. It wasn't that bad. I, 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 I had a good eye, you know. I mean, I, I'd be right behind the catcher. The closer you get, the better perspective you get on the ball. You know, someone had a ten they were kind of afraid, I think. They stood back a little bit, you know, but I, I would be right on their shoulder to, to watch the pitches. And, uh, and I didn't have much problem. And, uh, Did you ever get hit? Yeah, but I, I wore the inside protector, you know, which, which meant that you, you could get even closer to the mm -hmm. catcher. Mm -hmm. The only one was in high school. I was umpiring a high school game, and it was a tournament. And Wuben was playing Danvers. And when a guy called me up ahead of the umpires, I says, you know, I says, I shouldn't be umpiring this game. He says, what do you mean? I says, I come from Wuben. Wuben's playing Danvers. He says, George, I got no one else. He says, and I've already passed it by the coach of uh, Danvers. And he says, it's okay by him. You know, he knows who you are. And Bart McDonough was the coach for Wuben High School, and uh, I was up there, and Bart had a habit around the seventh inning, if there was a man on third base, he figured the umpire might get a little lazy, and then if the if they pitcher had a kind of a quirky motion, all of a sudden he'd yell, balk, and the umpire would say balk, and the runner would come home, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so when I was umpiring, he did the same thing I didn't say a word. He says, that was a buck. Um, that was a buck. I said, no. The coach for Dammers come over. He says, you know something? He pulls that crap on me every time. Every time, he says. I says, I played for him. I know his tricks. You know, Bat would be on the bench. You'd think he was half asleep, but he wasn't. <laughs> you know, it gives you that impression. Yeah. You know, and then uh, with that, I get a recommendation. I started doing college games. Is that how you went from high school to college? Yeah. Based on recommendations. Yeah. Because you have a long career in umpiring. How many years now have you been in it? I started in 52. But then, uh, then I became a district administrator. And uh, in 69, they... Uh, they appointed me a state director of Massachusetts, you know. But uh, then I get a call one day from the Boston Red Sox. Larry Cancro had a market in, and he said, George, he says, uh, we're going to have an old-timers game here at Fenway Park. Major League ball players, old-timers game. We'd like you to umpire the game. Wow. You know, get someone else, but you have to wear the old-type uniform. You know, uh, the outside protector and, the, you know, the jacket and all that stuff. So uh, I umpired at Fenway Park, and it was great. The old-timers were just... And who did you have for old-timers at that game? We had uh, Bob Montgomery, uh, Jim Lomberg, you know, and those guys, Rico Petroselli. And, uh, like, the manager would be, like, Sam Mealy, uh, old-time managers of Major mm -hmm. League Baseball. And... So different from the regular players. Mm -hmm. They would do anything for you. They love to sign autographs. Mm -hmm. In fact, they would go to a regular player in the clubhouse and ask him for an autograph. 
Yeah. And I say to myself, you know, this is Don DiMaggio. I mean, he should be tickled pink that he's asking for money. He be, should be asking Don for his autograph, yeah. you know? But they weren't the same. They weren't the same. Not the same. They're Why do you think that is? The strictly, money? Strictly business. Business, huh? Strictly business. Yeah. Now, you're very active in the Bow Sox. Why don't you tell me what the Bow Sox is as an organization and how you got involved? It's amazing how the Bow Sox got involved. In 1966, the Red Sox had the lowest attendance in the history of baseball. I mean, they were losing all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and they, they come in next to last place. So what they did over the winter, the public relations director, Bill Crowley, he got a hold of some of the ex-ball players like Eddie Pellegrini and Donovan and Lepsio and them, and some big business people, and says, uh, we'd like to start a booster club to help us promote baseball, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, you'll be the official booster club for the Red Sox, you know, called the Bo Sox Club, and uh, which I joined. Our job then, believe it or not, we would take you in and say, these are the seats that are available that you can buy. You'd be like three rows in back, in back of the field. I mean, you could pick any seat you wanted. Really? When you think of today, you can't get a ticket, no. you know? And that was our job to promote them. And then we'd have a luncheon once a month and we'd have two Red Sox players and two vision teams who's ever in. We'd do interviews with them, but some of the, the announcers like Ken Coleman and Joe Castiglione and them. And that's how we started. And uh, lucky enough, we started in 66 and in 67, they won the pennant I know. and the World Series. And Tickets went through the roof. Yeah, to the Bow Sox. Oh, yeah. hats off. Oh, it's amazing. We <laughs> and have, you've been with them ever since, right? Yeah, I, I was president in 88 and 89 of the Bow Sox, and uh, we have over 700 members, and we have a, a luncheon once a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, It's still going strong. Yeah. It's still going strong, and you're still active with them. They're, they're still good. Wow. How did you get involved at the Little League uh, World Championships in, is it Pennsylvania? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did that all come about? Well, what, you, what they would do then, the chief umpire from Williamsport. Williamsport, if Pennsylvania. You, if you put your name in to umpire the World Series, he would actually come out and watch you work a couple of games. At your local level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would... At a, at a tournament locally, because he wouldn't take your word for it that this guy is good and stuff like that. I got selected in uh, 1964 mm -hmm. to umpire. The day before I, ready, I was ready to leave, I took a heart attack. No, really? So then it took me quite a while, and then I, I applied again, and I went down in 69, and... Uh, did the World Series. The way I, I got my Major League scouting, I was at the... that's right, you were a scout for the Major League. I got my mm -hmm. little... I was on the Little League World Series in 1959, and uh, my friend from Rhode Island said, Judge, I got a friend of mine up in Massachusetts. He says, he's a scout, but he's looking for someone to do high school games in the New England area. He says, and I told him how, you know, you're an umpire, and... You played ball. So I got a call, and then we signed up with him, and I scouted with the Oakland, well, actually, with Kansas City A's. Then they moved to Oakland. Then I scouted with Oakland. From Oakland, I went to the Montreal Expos, and I ended up with uh, the Philadelphia Phillies. And how many years did you do this? I did it for 17 years. I tried to get with the Red Sox, but see, the Red Sox didn't have part-time scouts. They had... All full-time scouts. Full -time. Yeah. Yeah. George, um, how were some of the kids that you remember playing with in your high school team? And who do you remember as being, you know, kind of a standout for baseball, where you really did go on to scout? I'm sure even then you had a good eye. Were there women have some good ball players? Joe Castiglione. Oh, really? If he'd have listened to me, he'd have made the majors. You're kidding. Great catcher. He was a great catcher. And uh, there'd always be at least 10 or 12 scouts watching them okay. at a high school game. And at that time, 
I was with uh, Kansas City, and I said to Joe, I just got word, we're looking for catchers and center fielders. Mm -hmm. We want a guy that can throw the ball from the outfield, and we're looking for catchers. I said, I've watched you catch. I've been behind the, the plate. I'm trying to watch you catch, you know. And, I, and Detroit was after him and the others. His brother Frank, who got killed in the Lightning, he won in the sand with the Red Sox. I said, Joe, they just signed two catchers. They just signed one for 75000 and one for 100000 All they offered you was 5000 You know where you stand on the totem pole? They're going to look at them because that's their investment. It's money here. You know, they're going to give them all the chances. He went down to my, the minor leagues. In those days, the minor leagues didn't have great lighting. But they tell me he could catch. Really? He could catch, yeah, and, and, a, and, a, and a decent hitter. He has a brother here that still lives in town, doesn't he, George? Louis. Louis. But he, Joe probably was one of the best athletes to come out of Woburn. Really? Yeah, he had the scoring record football statewide. I mean, he was like a bull. He'd get that ball and he'd go through that line like there was nothing there. You know, and he played the years that Joe Bellino played for Winchester. He did? Yeah. Now, how about any other ball players that you think? Because Woburn, at, some, at one point over the years, way We had before... Butch McLaughlin from North Woburn. Mm -hmm. And uh, Butch was a center fielder. Good ball player. He signed with the Braves. And uh, so in the wintertime when he came home, one day, it was myself and Bob Vary, and would say, Butch, how you doing? He says, not bad, so I'm moving up next year to mm -hmm. a higher level. The next year we've seen him, how you doing? Not bad, I'm moving up. He says, we got this black kid. Holy God, he says, can he hit? He's got a bat so quick, I can't believe it. Never seen it. His name was Hank Aaron. Oh, really? <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. Huh? He it says, was quick, wasn't it? It was, you know. Yeah. He says he never seen a guy with such a quick bat that could hit. He says, and it wasn't that much to him. You know, he wasn't really big and strong either, you know. Mm -hmm. He was just quick. He says, he's a phenomenon. He says, you know, that's what we're up against. Wow. And he says, the higher you step up in your divisions, the, the better they get. Right, right. You know? What's your biggest thrill in baseball? My biggest one? Thrill. Actually, uh, the biggest one, actually, was the World Series, and I'm probably in the Fenway Park, but my other thrill was having uh, talked and been with Ted Williams. Really? That's great. Yeah, we, uh, when I was president of the Bow Sox, we go down to spring train every year, mm -hmm. and we had a ritual there that we would present the mayor of Winter Haven with a Paul Revere Bowl, and he would give the president of the Bow Sox the key to the city. Mm -hmm. And then this one year, we had the, uh, the bowl and, uh, to present to Ted. He took the picture with us. Was he a nice guy? Yeah, he, he was strictly baseball. Loved to talk baseball, mm -hmm. you know, especially hitting. I mean, it was just a a passion he had. But uh, but we were down in Winter Haven and we'd have like a banquet and he sh he'd show up, mm -hmm. showed up early and taking pictures, autographs. And uh, he'd say to Sam Mealy, he was one of the instructors, the next manager, he'd say to Sam, when that glass gets so far down, he was drinking scotch, you make sure I don't have to wait. And G Sam's job was to watch the glass, go over and get it, <laughs> like that. And he'd be talking to the people and, you know, signing autographs, you know. Yeah. This award, George, that you won here. Yeah, this was uh, last year. Every three years, we have what we call an international congress. Mm -hmm. We have the district administrators from all over the world. <clears throat> and you bid for where you want to host it. Mm -hmm. I hosted it in Boston in 1992, mm -hmm. the Congress. Last year it was in Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, 
So we went down there. I had no idea what was going on. My son John did. So then they, uh, the talk, and then the national president, you know, talked about the award. Uh, he's a senior DA from all of the league baseball throughout the world, mm -hmm. and wow. for the efforts and stuff that he's given, you know, we'll present him with this trophy of dedication of over 50 years. So they they That's present me. That's unbelievable. It's beautiful. Uh, That's yeah. heavy. It is. It's it is all really glass. heavy. It's beautiful. And uh, then I took pictures with them. You know, they were the president and the chairman of the board. Right. And uh, it was quite an honor. Then they uh, also gave my son John an award mm -hmm. because he's our state information officer. Oh, really? Anything you want to know about Little League, about information, he's the guy. Your son? Yeah. Oh, he does everything. He does all the scheduling for the tournaments. I mean, wow. it's just, just So yeah. he, for one son followed in your steps, I guess, yeah. huh, with a love of baseball. But but they all got involved in Little League. In fact, the last game I umpired in Woburn, the whole four of us were umpiring on that game. Really? Yeah, because they umpired too, besides coaching. And uh, I remember the kid in the dugout. I could hear him say to his manager, he says, Coach, I can't believe they got four umpires. Lucky there's always two, there's four. And, uh, and the coach says, yeah, he says, it's a father and three sons. Mm 